Next, uh, another application here is colors. So let's talk about colors a little bit. So we can talk a little bit about the color wheel. Do you guys remember what the order of the colors is in the spectrum? Blue is the shortest wavelengths, and red the... Red? What comes after red? Uh, orange, yellow, green, per, uh, blue, and... Uh, no, violet and blue. Uh, blue and violet. Sounds like that. No, blue and violet, for sure. Blue and violet. Okay. That's right. So that's the way I remember it. Roy G. Biv. Roy G. Biv. R O Y. Roy. Oh, okay. G. And then it's not V, it's Biv. Yeah. Roy G. Biv. Okay. Um, so this is a good way to remember the order of the colors in the spectrum. Do you know which of these is longest in wavelength? Uh, red. Right. So which is the smallest in wavelength? Uh, with violet. Right. Remember the symbol for wavelength is lambda, the Greek letter L. So we know that light uh, has both wave and particle characteristics. Well, right now I'm focusing on the wave characteristics and talking about its wavelength. So would the red have the biggest or the smallest frequency? Smallest, smallest. frequency. Because they're inversely. That's right. In fact, that's good. Do you know what's the equation that relates wavelength and frequency? C equals uh, V multiplied by lambda. Or C divided by lambda. I mean, the speed of light divided by um, frequency. Good. I would generally write that like this, but then you can solve this for either lambda or frequency. Mm -hmm. Actually, some courses use nu for frequency. What's uh, your course? Uh, we use nu or f? No, we use nu. You use new. Okay. So new is, uh, it looks like a V, but it's the Greek letter nu. All right, so instead of F, I'll put in uh, something, the, the Greek letter oh. nu. Okay, that's why I said V. <laughs> Just because, yeah, it looks like a V. You gotta, you gotta try to draw it somehow so it has like a it's a little line. different from a V. Yeah. Okay. So this is supposed to be nu, not a V. It's actually not that great a symbol because that might make you think that it stands for speed or velocity, and you might confuse it with the speed of light here, but uh, that's the convention. All right, so here's our new. So what does C stand for? Speed of light. In the vacuum. vacuum. Right. And uh, okay. So if you, uh, and as you're, we're seeing, this says there's an inverse relationship between these because this is a constant. So if this is big, this would have to be small in order for the equation still to be true. All right. Now red here we said was the smallest frequency. Does that mean that it's high energy or low energy? Low energy. Good. It's good that you know that. Because uh, another uh, with Planck constant, it will be uh, directly related to each other. Great, that's good. That's good that you knew that. I should learn <laughs> after two years. <laughs> What's that equation that relates energy? Uh, it's going to be E equals um, V by H. H, H is no. Planck's. Okay. Um, constant which equals 6.626 uh, to the 10 to the minus 34. Good. Uh, That's right. Joules per second. Joules times seconds. Yeah, joules times seconds. Okay, good. <laughs> in case you needed that, is that in your uh, under back covers here someplace? Yeah, probably. It's chapter 7. <clears throat> Yeah, so just for reference, you take a look at the inside back cover. You see where the constants are here? Yep. Up here? Is there an H there? Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So that shows that you were right. So you can always look that up if you need that. They also have the speed of light in that table, too. Right. Oftentimes we can approximate that as 3 times 10 to the 8th. Okay, good. All right, so this is a little flowchart. I think you're already familiar with the idea that if you knew the wavelength, how could you find the energy? 
Well, if you know the wavelength, you can use this equation to find nu, and then you can use this equation to find the energy. So it's pretty common to have to go back and forth between these three things. And it's good that you specifically pointed out that wavelength and frequency are inversely related, but frequency and energy are directly related, which also is apparent from this equation. Um, these are inversely related because they're on the same side of the equation, whereas energy and nu are on opposite sides of the equation, which makes them directly related. So that means they move in the same direction. Okay. So in a way, this wheel is a little bit misleading because it, uh, these, these things that are right next to each other are actually quite different from each other. But we'll see in a second why it's useful to draw this as a wheel anyway. So what influences the color of an object? Well, different objects absorb different wavelengths. Now, if you absorb, um, so for example, you might absorb the orange wavelength. Now, if you absorb the orange wavelength, what color will that make you? Well, it won't make you orange, because there won't be any orange light left, so there won't be any orange light hitting people's eyes. So you won't be orange, you'll be all the other colors. You'll be all the other colors, but which one is going to dominate the one in the middle over here? Blue, because That's right. you go opposite. Okay. That's right. That's the trick. All right, looks like you guys are already pretty familiar with this. All right, that's good. So we know that the, the, the wavelengths that will still exist are all these other wavelengths, and the one that will dominate is the one in the middle. So the good shortcut is the, light, the color that you see is the one that's opposite to the color that was absorbed in the wheel. That's the advantage of drawing the color wheel. Um, you identify what's being absorbed, and the thing that's opposite from that is the thing that's uh, going to be the dominant color. So if orange was absorbed, the dominant color would be blue. So you would see the, perceive the object as blue. Good. So how about if we're absorbing the green, what color would we see? Red. Because the red is opposite to the green. So that's why we had to know what the order of the colors was, because otherwise we don't know who's opposite to who in the wheel. So Roy G. Biv. So if you absorb green, you're going to see the object will appear red. How about if the color appears violet? If the object appears violet, what's the main wavelength that's being absorbed? Yellow. Yellow, because this is opposite. So you can also go in the opposite direction. Okay, that's how you use the color wheel. Good. Now, how does that apply to these transition metals? Well, let's say that we had a photon of light. I mentioned a second ago that light has both wave and particle characteristics. When we're focusing on the particle characteristics, we call the light photons. The name photon is the name for a particle of light. In fact, I should have been more specific here then. This tells us the wavelength of each photon. This tells us the frequency of each photon. And what, most important, this tells us the energy of each photon. This doesn't tell us the total energy in the beam of light. It tells us the energy per photon. I should start getting the habit of always writing that. This is the equation that tells us the energy of each photon. The energy of a photon is Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon. Now, actually, let's say that we were shining, say, white light at this substance. That means there would be all, a whole bunch of different photons with different wavelengths. A bunch of different photons with different wavelengths. But only some of those photons can be absorbed. Which ones can be absorbed? Well, what's going to happen if this absorbs a photon? What would happen if this substance absorbed a photon in general? Would show its other, um, its opposite color. Right? But what would happen to the substance? How does the substance absorb a photon? Now, the fo each photon has energy. Mm -hmm. And we have conservation of energy. The energy can't just disappear. So where did the energy go after the photon was absorbed? To the higher level, sir? Yeah, it's used to promote an electron to a higher level. So if we absorb a photon, we could take one of the electrons from down here and promote it up here. This is not too happy to be up here because this is a strong field case, maybe. But if we put in enough energy, we can promote this electron up to here. This is called an excited electron now.
Now, quantum mechanics says that we can only absorb a photon if it has the exact right amount of energy to move an electron between levels. The only photon that can be absorbed is one that has the exact right amount of energy to move, the, uh, to move an electron between the levels. So if a photon has more energy than is required, it won't be absorbed. And if it has less energy than is required, it won't be absorbed. And the photons can't gang up and pull an electron together. It has to be enough energy on one photon to move the electron. So only one type of photon will be absorbed here. Only the type of photon which has the exact right wavelength um, is going to be absorbed um, in this case. Uh, and this is the reason why transition metal complexes often exhibit colors because a single, uh, a single key wavelength is going to be absorbed and then your color will be the opposite of that wavelength.